الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Indeed our praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator, the sustainer and the controller of all that happens in the universe and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger his family, his companions, and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. By now, of course, all of us know that we are in the month of Dhul Hijjah, and by next Tuesday or by Wednesday next week, we will be celebrating Eid al Adha. Now, one of the particular features of Islam is that even at the time when we are obligated to celebrate, the celebration is not purely merrymaking. It's not simply a matter of enjoying oneself and indulging in pleasure. There is that to it, of course. But in addition to that, you will always find that in the Islamic perspective, celebration is also tempered with some reflection. And so we celebrate not simply solely uh, merrymaking and, and pursuing personal and physical enjoyment, but that is balanced with some reflection. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always encouraged us in the Qur'an to reflect, to think about things. And this is testament to the perspective, the Islamic perspective, that we should never lose sight of our journey back to the hereafter. See, when we lose sight of that objective, that our abode is actually the hereafter, and we're journeying to the hereafter, that's when we tend to simply pursue our own personal enjoyment and passions. And there is nothing wrong with being happy, mind you, or enjoying yourself. It's just that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has exerted us that while we pursue our own personal happiness and enjoyment, it should not be totally isolated from reflecting and thinking of the hereafter as well. And so as this Eid comes around, brothers and sisters, we need to do a little bit of reflection, in particular, regarding the significance of Eid al-Adha. What exactly does this Eid signify for us? What does it mean for us? We know that sacrificing an animal is an act of worship, it's ibadah. Whether you do it on Eid al-Adha or on other days, a sacrifice is ibadah. And this, this is why sacrificing at any time in a name other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is considered shirk. Because sacrifice is ibadah. But is the objective of Eid al-Adha simply uh, simply to get someone to do a sacrifice and that's it? Or is there more to it than that? The answer is of course there is more to it. Now first of all we have to understand that Eid al-Adha is a substitute for the original ibadah of Hajj. That's why those who can afford to, they go for Hajj. If you cannot go for Hajj, you celebrate Eid al-Adha. But whether you go for Hajj or you don't and therefore celebrate Eid al-Adha, both the original Ibadah, Hajj, and its substitute Eid al-Adha, both are based on certain events that unfolded in the life of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and his family. Now we, we don't have time to go into all the events 
But even if you were to look at all the events that transpired in the life of Prophet Ibrahim السلام, and his family, we will find, brothers and sisters, that all these events boil down to one thing, an expression of their willingness and their readiness to submit to Allah's commands. That's what they come down to. Every event was a test for Ibrahim السلام, and his family for them to show and to prove whether they are ready and willing to submit and surrender to Allah's commands. It's not just the order of Allah to sacrifice his son Ismail. All the other events that happened in his life as well, they were all a test for him to prove whether he truly submitted to Allah or not. And so for us brothers and sisters, Eid al-Adha is presented as an opportunity. It is our test, so to speak, our chance to show or to demonstrate whether we are ready and prepared and willing to submit to Allah's commands. So beyond the mere sacrificing of an animal, we must understand the message we're giving when we do the sacrifice. And even if one did not do the sacrifice, even if a person did not do a sacrifice, this is the time and other times, of course, that a person should reflect on this issue. Am I ready and am I prepared and am I willing to submit to Allah's commands? Am I ready to make the sacrifices that I need to make in order to fulfill Allah's commands? Prophet Ibrahim was tested, as we say, with the ultimate test. He was given perhaps the most difficult task a father could be given. And that is, he was ordered by Allah the Exalted to sacrifice his son. And this order, brothers and sisters, came in the form of a dream. This even made the test more, much harder. How? Because if Allah had ordered Ibrahim السلام, while he was wide awake to sacrifice his son, there is no way he could back out from this order. He was fully awake, fully conscious, in his full senses. So there is no trying to get around the order. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in giving him this order in a dream, actually presented to him the opportunity to seek ways around the order. That is how most of us live our lives today. We always seek a way around the order. Right? We look for loopholes, as we say. So Allah basically gave him a loophole. It's in the dream. He could have said, you know what, this is just a dream. No big deal. We dream all the time. But Ibrahim السلام, understood, brothers and sisters, that in as much as this order came in a dream, he realized and he understood that this was Allah's command and it was a test for him. And so, as a man of God, as a prophet of Allah, who was convinced that the purpose of his existence was submission to the Creator, there was only one choice he had really in front of him, and he made that choice. He decided he would fulfill Allah's command. But eventually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would accept his deeds and his actions from him. And in addition to that, Allah would also save his son. The same son he was ordered to sacrifice, Allah saved him. Why? Because Allah intended only to test his willingness to obey his commands. Not literally wanting him to kill his son. And this is interesting. Because in these ayats in Surah uh, Safar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after telling us that he informed Ibrahim, he stopped him from killing, actually killing his son. Allah says, وَنَادَيْنَاهُ أَيَّا Ibrahim, قَدْ صَدَّقْتَ الرُّؤْيَا We called out to him, O Ibrahim, you have fulfilled the order or you have fulfilled the vision. The vision was the dream he had in which he was ordered to sacrifice his son. Allah says to him, you will fulfill that. But remember, he was ordered to sacrifice his son, 
He hasn't done that yet. He's close to doing that. Yet Allah tells him, you have fulfilled it. Why? Because the objective right from the beginning, although Ibrahim salam did not know this, Allah's objective from the beginning was to test him, for him to demonstrate whether he was ready and willing and prepared to obey Allah's command, despite how difficult the command must have been for him. Now when he showed and demonstrated his willingness to do this, the result was Allah accepted that demonstration of submission to him. And number two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provided a way out of the difficulty he found himself in. And that difficulty was to kill his son. Allah provided a way out by what? By substituting his son with a, a lamb, as we say. وَفَدَيْنَاهُ بِذِبْحٍ عَظِيمٍ Allah says, and we ransomed him or we set him free with a great sacrifice. Then Allah says, brothers and sisters, after he said to Ibrahim alayhi salam, قَدْ صَدَّقْتَ الرُّؤْيَا You have fulfilled the order or the vision. إِنَّا كَذَلِكَ نَجْزِ الْمُحْسِنِينَ Surely this is how we reward the righteous. How? How does Allah reward the righteous? It is connected to the story of Ibrahim. Here, the how Allah rewards the righteous means that he will provide for them a way out of the difficulty they might be in, just as long as they're willing to submit and surrender to his command. You see, brothers and sisters, very often, when we're faced with certain commands, it, they may seem difficult for us. And it is this difficulty that makes us hesitant and reluctant to obey Allah's command. But Allah tells us in these verses that once we demonstrate our willingness to submit and surrender to Him, it is He who will provide ease for us. We're initially worried about the difficulty involved. We're trying to make it easy. But Allah teaches us here that first and foremost we should submit and surrender and that he will provide the ease. So we need not worry about the ease, brothers and sisters. See, we worry about the ease up front and what happens, it, it negatively affects how we submit or whether we submit to Allah or not. It affects us, it makes us hesitant. What Allah teaches us is, we should first and foremost submit and he will provide the ease. What we do is we seek the ease first, then we want to submit. Allah said no. That's not how you do it. You submit first, then the ease will be provided. The ease will be provided. We do not have to look for the ease or find it ourselves. It is Allah the Exalted who will provide that ease. And so as we celebrate this Eid, brothers and sisters, the bigger issue we should ponder and think about, not just uh, you know personally, but perhaps uh, ideally with our families as well, with our children, we should sit down with them and reflect together on this issue. What exactly is the significance or the lessons of Eid al-Adha? And what steps can we take in order to achieve that? As I said on Monday, this is an exercise that we should engage our families in as well. This is how we can pass on to our children sound knowledge and grounding solid foundations in terms of how they perceive the Islamic legislation, the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because sometimes they will find sort of a conflict between what Allah has ordered and the kind of society and the kind of trends in society that they're faced with. And they may or may not be able to reconcile this. So they will have to make choices. It's either this or this, but they need to understand that most times, brothers and sisters, it's not so much an, an, an issue of, well, I have to choose this over this, but rather it is finding a balance. It is finding a balance. So we need them to be well-grounded. We have to lay for them a solid foundation that will enable them, mashallah, to reconcile, if you like, the trends in society with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered. Of course, there are certain trends in society 
that are completely unacceptable and incompatible with what Allah has ordered. So there is no reconciliation here. The, the, the answer is clear. What is haram is clear. We can't, you know, camouflage it or, or cover it up. No. What is haram is clear. We have to avoid that. But there are many things that may not be haram that once we find a balance, mashallah, this is what Allah demands from us. So we should sit with our families and as we plan and we prepare for Eid al-Adha, talk about what exactly is the significance of the sacrifice for us. What should it mean for us? What lessons does, does Allah want us to learn from this experience? Because about Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran in Surah Al-Hajj that the purpose of going on this journey, the purpose of going on the journey, it's not just to perform certain rituals. That of course is important. But the purpose of the journey, Allah says, is so that the hujjaj can witness things with their own eyes that will be of benefit to them. So that they may witness things that will bring benefit to them. And here Allah wants us to be eyewitnesses. That's why we go on Hajj. Similarly with the Eid al-Adha, although we don't go for Hajj, there are certain lessons that we must learn in order to benefit from the sacrifice or to benefit from this time. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He open up our hearts and minds so that we can understand this beautiful message He has revealed for mankind. And may He inspire us all to live by this message. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause us all to be among those who constantly reflect and ponder on, on his signs and on his uh, ayats. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to achieve submission and surrender to him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our duties easy to perform for us. And may he give us uh, ways out of the difficulties we face from time to time. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. May Allah also accept from us our good deeds. Uh, our sacrifice on, on the Eid, on the day of Eid, and all our, uh, our other good deeds, and may He forgive for us our mistakes and shortcomings. Uh, also, uh, since I probably won't see most of you again, uh, I would like to say Eid Mubarak to you and your families. Kullu am min antum bi khair. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us and all the Muslims, and in particular our brothers and sisters who have gone for Hajj. Aqulu qawli hadha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.